who is going to talk to us about semi-classical measures for higher dimensional quantum cat maps. As usual, don't hesitate to ask questions in the chat or uh, by talking uh, directly. Uh, we'll transmit the questions into the chat to the speaker. Okay, so thanks Laura for the introduction and thanks the organizer for giving me the opportunity of uh, discussing this work. Um, so as you can see, this is a joint work with uh, Semyon Dyatlov, uh, who is also at MIT, and the topic is a semi-classical measure for higher dimensional quantum cat maps. Uh, but I guess that it is likely that uh, some of you don't know what a quantum cat map is, quite cat map is. So I will start uh, by recalling a few facts about classical cat map and then uh, introduce their quantum equivalent. And uh, finally, I will introduce semi classical measures and uh, state our main results and maybe give a few hints of the, the proof of this result. But uh, before doing all of that, I will just start to give a motiva motivation for our, our work, which is um, a result with quantum chaos. So quantum cat maps are often considered as toy model for like uh, problems in quantum chaos related to compact uh, negatively curved Riemannian manifold. So the, our result is uh, related to this uh, result by uh, Dyatlov, Jean, and Leonard Maher in the case in the geometric context which is, so I guess you, you probably know that if you look at the eigenstate for the laplace Beltrami operator on a Riemannian surface, then they satisfy a unique continuation principle, meaning that uh, like holomorphic functions, they cannot vanish on an open set. But uh, when you are on a compact negatively curved Riemannian surface, then uh, you know that there is a uniform version of this uh, unique continuation principle, meaning that uh, not only the, it can vanish on an open set, but the mass which is carried by an open set is uniformly bounded from below, uh, uniformly with respect to the eigenstate. Okay, so the, if the eigenstate is as normal in L2, the mass of a given open set is uniformly bounded from below. And uh, so this is something, so it may not be clear why now, but it's related to the quantic unique ergodicity conjecture, which was formulated by Rudnik and Sarnak. I will tell a, a few words about it in the context of quantum cat maps later. So. But just for the sake of name dropping, I put that here. And uh, what's very important here, and what's actually the main focus of our work, is that this result by Jatogin and Maher is uh, restricted to the case of surface. So this is only valid in the two-dimensional case because uh, the proof is based on the application of the fractal uncertainty principle, which is a result of harmonic analysis, which is only known, uh, I mean, in a tractable way in the one-dimensional case so that you cannot pass the uh, low-dimensional case in this result. And the, the focus of our work was with Semyon was to prove a similar result in higher dimension. Okay, so now that we have this uh, motivation, let's go to the main topic of this talk, which are cat maps. And let's start with classical cat maps, which are a very common uh, application in dynamic, in particular in hyperbolic dynamics. So cat map is um, just the action of a matrix with integer coefficient on the on a torus. So I see the torus as a quotient of a Euclidean space by the lattice uh, ZM. Uh, and so if you have a matrix with integer coefficient, it, it acts on this quotient. And um, if the determinant is one, it will be invertible. So it, in, it induces a diffeomorphism on the torus. So this is called a cat map, cat map meaning uh, continuous automorphism of the torus, but uh, this is obviously a pun since this is a denomination which is due to Arnold. Uh, and among cat maps, there are uh, some particular cases we will be mostly interested in. So the main one is, uh, I mean, the one which has been widely studied is the hyperbolic case, which is when the matrix A has no eigenvalue of modulus one. Okay, in that case, uh, the, the associated cat map is an example of anosov diffeomorphism, which is like a widely studied class of hyperbolic uh, dynamic. And this is like the main example of uh, anosov diffeomorphism, as are not many other examples up to 
continuous conjugate. And uh, for the first part of the higher dimensional steps that we want to do, we will also study another property, which is called spectral gap, which is just uh, the existence of a leading eigenvalue. So there is a simple eigenvalue whose modulus is strictly larger than the modulus of all the other eigenvalues. So a priori, this, um, these properties are unrelated, but notice that in dimension two, they are equivalent, okay? because, uh, because of the determinant one assumption. And uh, for quantum uh, mechanics, we need a symplectic structure. So we will assume uh, later that the dimension is even and that the matrix A preserves uh, the classical uh, symplectic form on R2D. OK, so now I will be very unfair to hyperbolic dynamics. And I will tell you just what you need to know about uh, the, the dynamic of a cat map to understand the, the proof of, the, of our main result with um, uh, Semyon. And I, uh, just for like, I mean, mainly for a pictorial region, I will restrict to the 2D case. So what does it mean to be hyperbolic? It means that you have a splitting of uh, your space into two directions, the unstable direction, which is a span of uh, eigenvectors associated to eigenvalue larger than one, and the stable direction, which is the span of eigenvectors with eigenvalues smaller than one. So the unstable space will be stretched by the action of the matrix, and the stable direction, which will be uh, contracted by the action of the matrix. And we will not look at the, at the orbit of a point, because hyperbolic dynamical systems they are uh, notoriously chaotic, so there is no op to describe the long-term asymptotic of the orbit of any point. So what we do is that we look at the action on um, locally defined objects such as like uh, probability measure, functions, distribution, things like that. So here uh, I took uh, a set, let's say a, a green rectangle, but you can see it like as a somewhere where I put some mass, like a, 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 distribu a probability distribution with a small support, for instance. And then I look at the action of um, my matrix on this uh, small rectangle. And what happens is that, okay, it's contracted in the blue direction, stretched in the red direction, and after a few iterations, it starts to look like a, a long, thin line. And, um, but this is, if you forget that this is a part of the torus. If you look at the actual dynamics that happen on the torus after a few iterations, this line will be of a size which is comparable to the size of the torus, so it will start to wrap around. So it rather looks like that, you see? If you start with something very small, the first iteration, you don't see that you are like actually on a compact manifold, but after a few iteration, you start to look like a line that wraps around the torus. And in the 2D case, uh, by, just by um, basic number theoretic consideration, you can see that the, the slope of this line, so, so, so this is a line which is aligned with the unstable direction. And the, uh, in dimension two, the unstable direction is uh, at an irrational slope. So not only this uh, small open set will start to look like a line, but it will start to look like a dense line. So you really have this thing in hyperbolic dynamic that you start with something which is localized and you will see not only something which is dense, but dense with a very particular geometrical stru structure, like some kind of foliation by the unstable direction. And uh, this is all what we will need about hyperbolic dynamics. So once again, there are much more that can be said, of course, uh, but uh, later on in the proof, you will need just to remember this, uh, this drawing. Okay, so let's go to the quantum equivalent of this uh, cat maps. Uh, so the first definition of a quantum cat map uh, has been given by Anne and Berry in the 80s. Uh, if you are interested in this topic, you can also refer to uh, a paper by Degli Esposti and mainly by Buzwina and De Bief, which is a very, very complete article about the construction of this quantum cat map and uh, also to the first section of our paper with Simeon. Uh, so the, maybe, okay, it's at least for me, which was totally new to this kind of topic when I started this project, it was not clear what you need to do. What is a quantum cat map? What kind of object do you want to construct? So let's just make clear what you want to do. So in quantum mechanics, you uh, describe a state 
uh, of a physical system by an element of norm one in a Hilbert space. And the first thing that I will do is give you a definition of the Hilbert space that we are going to study. And since we want to study something um, uh, related to the classical cat map that I just discussed, we want to discard state whose phase space, so the space of position and momentum, will be uh, 2D dimensional tops with like D coordinates that corresponds to position that I will denote by X and D coordinates that correspond to momentum or frequency that I will denote by X. Once you have done that, you must uh, associate to each observable as that is to each function on the phase space, here's the 2D dimensional torus, uh, uh, like a quantum observable that is an operator on your phase of state that will uh, be used to make sense of what is a measurement of uh, something in your physical state. And finally, uh, we will define a unitary operator, which will be, I will explain why, the quantum equivalent of the classical cat map from the previous slide. So let's start with the space of states. So to do so, I will choose a large parameter, which we call B n. So if you are a acquainted with uh, semi-classical analysis or micro-local analysis, this is the inverse of H up to some constant. And you can interpret it, for instance, as the number of particles in your system, meaning that when n tends to infinity, you look at what's called the semi-classical limit. That is, you, you expect that the, quant the law of quantum mechanics will Im imply the classical mechanics when n turns to infinity. You expect to retrieve something from the classical dynamics when n turns to infinity. And just for, uh, because I don't want to introduce a lot of conditions that are uh, not very important, I will assume that this integer is even, but this is not needed actually. And I give like a very simple definition of my space of states, which is just, I look at a function on a, a, a grid, z over nz to the power d, uh, that are square integrable. I mean, of course, all functions are square integrable, but the Hilbert structure is the structure of square integrable function. And you notice here, so this thing, you, z over nz to the d, you can see it as a grid on a d-dimensional torus uh, with uh, like a width, which becomes thinner and thinner when n tends to infinity. Uh, this is how, like when you work with uh, something on, uh, if you study particles that move in RD, you will look at L2 of RD and the phase space will be R of 2D because you can look at frequency by using a Fourier transform. And here, this is the same. You look at function on a grid in a D-dimensional torus, which will be the position space, but actually, the phase space is given that position and momentum. So this is actually a, a, a Hilbert space of states whose phase space will be a 2D dimensional torus. Even though there is only a D, you know. So there are a lot of, uh, so I gave you a very simple definition because I, I want to have something that I can explain like in one hour, but there are a lot of other definitions. You can see it as a space of uh, temper distribution. You can see it as a, space of holomorphic section of a complex line bundle. There are really like many definitions, but this is like the, I took the most straightforward and, and, and done towards definition for this stuff. And as I mentioned, so this is a position space, but you can uh, go from position to momentum by like there is a, an analog of the Fourier transform, uh, which is a unitary operator. This is exactly on, uh, if you were working on L2 of um, RD, uh, you have a Fourier transform. We, actually, the, the formula that I give you is kind of reminiscent of the formula for the Fourier transform. And uh, okay, this is just something if you if you know about position, position you find out momentum by uh, this Fourier transform. Okay, so this is a space of state. Uh, the main thing is that we don't really care about the actual construction of the space of state. What is important is the operators that we are going to define on it and how they interact with each other. So first, I want to quantize observables. So there is a procedure that I will not describe in detail. I will give a few examples that associate to every uh, smooth function on the 2D dimensional torus an operator on the space of state. And this procedure is called quantization. So there are a lot of things that are called quantizations in, uh, uh, in mathematics. Uh, and there are a few properties that you want to do in order to for a, such a procedure to deserve being called quantization. 
So I listed a few of them here. So the first one is just because if you want to do math, you need to have some control of what happened when n turns to infinity. So in particular, if a does not depend on n, the, the associated operator will be uniformly bounded as n turns to infinity. The second assumption is something that you need for uh, quantum mechanics, because in the action, you need to associate to every real valued function. You need to associate something which is uh, self-adjoint. So here, um, you actually have something slightly smaller. You, you exactly know what is the adjoint of, um, uh, of a pseudo differential operator. So this is called the this property is because what we use actually is strongly related to the file quantization for those who are familiar with this notion. And then uh, you have where some things become interesting. You know that your observables are commutative, meaning that if you multiply two functions, this is like a commutative operation, but multiplying two operators is not. And um, so when you do this quantization procedure, at uh, first order, you get something that resembles uh, like the multiplication of, uh, of a function, with meaning that when you compose two uh, pseudo differential operators, you get something which is uh, still, which is the operator corresponding to the product of your observables. But you have an error term. This error term actually is uh, non zero. And this is something which is very systematic of quantization. You want something that turns. Uh, commutator into Poisson packet. And uh, we will not use this fact, but this is something which is, I, I wanted to mention it just because, okay, this is what you expect from a quantization procedure that a commutator is turned into a Poisson packet. Actually, this is one of the ways to see that in the semi classical limit, you get something which is reminiscent from classical dynamics, because of course the Poisson packet induces a Hamiltonian dynamics. Okay, uh, how do you construct this quantization? Uh, let me give two uh, very basic examples. Uh, if your uh, observable only depends on your d first coordinate, so on the position coordinate, your operator will just be a multiplication operator. Okay, you see a, a is a function of, if a is a function of the d dimensional torus, and if you interpret the element of the space state as function on the grid on the torus, you just multiply it by A. And now if uh, A only depends on the last D coordinates, that is if A is uh, uh, only dependent on momentum, what you do is actually exactly the same after taking the Fourier transform to uh, translate everything to momentum. So this is a Fourier multiplier. This is the exact analog of a Fourier multiplier on RD. Okay, and then you have a, you have a formula to, which basically interpolate between these two situations that gives you the uh, uh, general formula. But actually, with these two things, you already know uh, all the quantization up to uh, small error terms because uh, you can use the multiplication. Uh, everyone is a sum of multiplication of things that only depend on x and y. So you know basically everything with these two examples. Um, okay, so maybe, so we have a quantization, we know a bit about the, its properties, but what do we want to do that? This is because, so as I told you, if you have an element of form one in your Hilbert space, this is supposed to describe the state of a physical system with phase, phase 2 d dimensional terms. And uh, if you have an observable A, you can make a measurement of A, so you can just sample like, you look at A and say, okay, what is the value of A in my actual, uh, in the actual state of the system? And the expected value that you are supposed to get for this measurement is given by uh, the quadratic form associated to uh, of A that you apply to your state psi. And here, uh, just, uh, we, we will really like think of it like this is a probability measure which is associated to psi, but this is not a probability measure. Okay, this thing is a priori not a positive functional. Uh, so this is not an expectation in the sense of uh, uh, like the big integral. But there is a very important uh, result regarding the inequality that says that when n tends to infinity, uh, this thing tends to behave like, this is almost positive. So it tends to behave like, um, uh, like, uh, like a probability measure. So in particular, if you take in an in adherence value when n tends to infinity, you will get something which will be 
a probability measure on the 2D dimension. Okay, so now we are, we are able to, to, we have some tools to describe the state of the system, but we want, uh, this is just static, we want a, a dynamic to, to be able to say what will be like the associated dynamic. And since we, we want something that acts an element of norm one in our Hilbert space, so we want a unitary operator. And there is so, uh, uh, a result, so there are a lot of ways to construct that, but if you have a symplectic, so you need a matrix to uh, be integer valued and symplectic, and to such a thing, you can associate a unitary map on the space of states, which satisfies the following uh, Egorov relation, which says that when you conjugate uh, pseudo differential operator, so op A, by your uh, unitary map that I will call a quantum cap map from the one, then it amounts to uh, compose the observable by your quantum cap map. And notice here, this is another, uh, uh, this is also because we have something which is strongly related to vile quantization. This uh, Egorov relation is exact. This is not like plus some remainder term which is small. This is like an, an algebraic relation. Okay, so there is no error term. This is kind of important. And uh, okay, so you have this unitary map. Let me mention that it is not unique uh, because you can multiply it by a complex number of uh, modulus one. But this is actually the only freedom that you have. And uh, if you are worried about that, you can uh, fix this uh, complex number if you replace the symplectic group by a twofold cover, which is called the metaplectic group. Okay, but we'll not need that because we'll only be interested in uh, eigenstate for this unitary map. So we don't care about like multiplying by the complex number of modulus one. Okay, so why is this thing uh, like an equivalent quantum equivalent of the uh, classical cap map? This is because of this, just what I said on the previous slide. If you, so you start from a state psi and you apply your quantum cap map. And now you make a measurement. You look what is the expected value of uh, a measurement of an observable A. And just by using like definition and what is uh, the adjoint on this Egorov relation, you see that the new measurement of A in your, in your new state obtained by applying your quantum cat map is actually the measurement of A composed with the classical cat map in your previous state. So it means that uh, this um, quantum cat map acts on a, acts on a state in your Hilbert space as your classical cat map acts on probability distribution on uh, the 2D dimensional tools. Okay, so this is why this is like where is the, the this is the relationship between why this is like uh, a quantum equivalent to your classical cat map. Uh, so you have this very important relation. And so, of course, the idea is, okay, what happens when uh, n tends to infinity if I have a, uh, Because you see that if psi is uh, an eigenstate for, uh, for the quantum cat map, the, it means that the associated measurement will be invariant by uh, the action of the classical cat map. So you get something which will be the, really the equivalent of an invariant probability measure for the classical cat map. And the question will be, when n tends to infinity, do we get like a limit which will be something like uh, an invariant probability measure? And which one? Like that's the kind of question that we want to understand. Okay, so I will, there are several ways to define this quantum cat map. You can do it by representation theory tools. You can get, give an explicit uh, formula. This is a Fourier integral operator. There are a lot of ways to, to do it. I will just give a few examples. So the first one is what I call a symplective leaf. So if you have a matrix that preserves the position and momentum decomposition, so basically you have just something that moves the position and then you have only one choice on what it has to do and the frequency uh, variable, then uh, the quantum cap map will just be like a precomposition by the inverse of, uh, of the matrix that acts on position. But if you have something that uh, interchanges frequency and position with a flip of sign because you need something symplectic, you have a 
so you have the Fourier transform, which of course makes sense because the Fourier transform is something which is supposed to, uh, this is what does the Fourier transform. It's in touch of this position and momentum, and this is what does this matrix as well. So it makes sense. And so actually it's a bit unfortunate that um, uh, this slide was a bit too small because with a third example, I could have given like a formula for all the, because if you add transvection, uh, and in some trans symplectic transvection, you get a set of generators for the symplectic group. And of course, if you know a, a, a quantum cat map for a set of generators, you know a quantum cat map for every element in the symplectic group. Uh, but then if you want to know the, so the, full, um, the full picture, you will have to go to the paper. Um, okay, so I think that we have all our uh, uh, set up now. We have a quantum phase of space, which okay, maybe a bit disappointing. This is a very simple space. We have a, a quantum observables, so a set of operators associated to classical observables, and we have unitary operators associated to uh, symplectic matrices. So what kind of uh, property you want to look? So here there is a, a theorem. So the statement is a bit complicated, but let me explain what it means. So what you want to do is look at the you have the eigenstates. They are kind of similar to invariant probability measure for uh, the classical cat map. What happens when n turns to infinity? So there is a theorem uh, due to Buswina on the behavior in the case of quantum cat map, but this is really an equivalent of a previous result by Schneerelman, Colin Verdier, and Zeldich for Riemann and Manipal, which is called the quantum ergodicity um, uh, theorem. So the only assumption that you need to make on your symplectic matrix is that uh, the big measure is ergodic, which actually is just a fancy way to say that one is not an eigenvalue of your uh, ergodic measure. Uh, one is not an eigenvalue of your matrix. Then, uh, since you have a, a unitary operator for every n, you have like a, you have a basis of eigenvectors, an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. And uh, what you do is that for every n, you choose one of these eigenvectors. And then you look at what happens to this like expected measurement. And the result is that it tends to uh, the uh, average of your observable for the big measure on the 2D dimension. So this is true up to a very small uh, condition is that you must select at each n, you must select your, uh, your eigenstate among uh, a set which is almost all eigenset, meaning that it is, uh, oh, so this should be a D here. So you have a set which has a asymptotic density one, and you need to select your eigenset in this set. So you need to withdraw some very particular eigenstates uh, to get convergence of the expected measurement to convergence of an actual uh, probability measure on the torus, which is actually the big measure. And of course, when you see that there is a, a very natural question is, do I actually need to withdraw some exceptional uh, eigenstate? Or could, could I get the, this convergence uh, without unconditionally like, uh, taking any eigenstate? So this is a conjecture which is called a quantum ergodicity conjecture. So the fact that you don't need to restrict to dimension to a density one subset of eigenstate. Uh, it has been formulated first by uh, Rudnik and Sarnak in the context of uh, Riemannian surface. And uh, there is like a, a natural equivalent in the case of um, um, in the case of quantum cat. And actually, I would like to reformulate to, to say slightly differently this um, uh, conjecture using the notion of semi-classical measure. So what is a semi-classical measure? This is exactly the limit of something that look like uh, when you look at your uh, expected measurement on the space of state. I told you this is something that do not that that is not a probability measure, but any adherent value when n turns to infinity should be uh, a probability measure. And actually, so these probability measures are called the semi-classical measure. Uh, for a, because here the phi ng that you select has to be an eigenstate. Against it. So instead of um, what you allow when you define semi-classical measure is to look at very particular sequences of eigenstates. Okay, 
And uh, so basically, the idea is to understand what happened for the eigensets that you, you removed in the quantum ergodicity theorem. So we would like to understand this semi-classical measure. And the first thing to notice is that since uh, the uh, quantum cat map acts on a state like the classical cat map acts on a probability measure, any semi-classical measure must be invariant by the action of A. So what we define here is a subset of uh, the set of invariant measures for the uh, classical cat map A. And this is interesting because in the hyperbolic uh, dynamic literature, the consideration about invariant measures are, are really central to the understanding of statistical properties for this thing. Uh, so the uh, reformulation of the quantum unique ergonicity conjecture is if uh, you are hyperbolic and if the dimension is two, uh, because there are, just because there are obvious, uh, obvious obstruction in the higher, higher, higher dimension, then there is only one semi-classical measure, which is the Beck measure. So uh, the equivalent for Riemannian surface is open, but actually we know that uh, this conjecture is wrong in for a two-dimensional cat map. So there is a counter example by Ford, Nonnenmacher, and Debievre. So we have some. So the quantum unique ergodic conjecture is the set of semi-classical measures is a point, and uh, this is wrong. But this is like a non-trivial subset of the invariant measure by A, uh, it, it cannot be anything. So we have like a lot of um, different results that gives like a restriction on what a semi-classical measure can be. So we have a result by uh, Riviere and uh, Brooks and, uh, that give entropy points. So the Kolmogorov entropy of a semi-classical measure, which is a, a notion from thermodynamical formalism that basically uh, measures how chaotic is the dynamic of A uh, from the point of view of this measure, uh, this entropy must be positive. And actually, there is like an explicit lower bound for this entropy. Uh, this uh, basically the kind of things that you rules out by this uh, theorem is uh, some classical measures that will be supported on the periodic orbit. This is not possible. Uh, this is not possible also because of a uh, result by Bonnery de Bievre and von Maher that says that you cannot have too many uh, atomic components. So when you, you can always decompose uh, a measure into, uh, you know, singular, le bay, and uh, atomic components, and the atomic components, they cannot be too large. Actually, they cannot carry more than half of the mass of the measure. Um, then you have something called the arithmetic quantum unique ergodicity. Uh, because, so what is the problem? Why do the uh, quantum ergodicity fail? This is due, and in one way to interpret it is that uh, there are a lot of spectral degeneracies for the quantum cat map, meaning that the quantum cat map has uh, eigenspaces of very high dimension. Okay, so eigenvalues with very high multiplicity, uh, which makes like a lot of choice possible when you construct um, semi classical measures. Uh, so, one way to, to solve this issue is to introduce a new set of operators called the EQ operators that are con constructed by number theoretic consideration. And these are operators that commute with the quantum cat map. So then instead of looking at the eigenstate of the quantum cat map, you look at the joint eigenstate of the quantum cat map and the EQ operators. So you, you remove a lot of spectral degeneracy, you kill a lot of multiplicity for the eigenvalues. And if you restrict to this particular uh, eigenset, so the joint eigenset, then you can get back the quantum unique ergodicity. Okay, well, the only semi-classical measure you, uh, constructing using only joint eigenset for quantum cat map on echo operators is the big measure. And actually, so you can get actually the, even like a rate of speed in the convergence in that case. And there is a higher dimensional version by Kelmer. Okay, and this is also uh, like most of the, this result actually have an equivalent in the geometric context. Uh, just the quantum case is often easier to understand. And finally, there is a recent result by Nir Schwartz uh, with a student of uh, Stefan Nenmacher that says that if you have a two-dimensional hyperbolic cat map, the associated quantum uh, cat maps has the only semi-classical measure with full support. Okay, so this is a 
not given by the entropy bound, for instance, because if you have, a, you can have like, a, so there, are, there are a lot of invariant measures for hyperbolic matrices. And in particular, you have uh, measures that are supported on counter set, but with, with positive entropy. And, may, uh, may, I, may I ask you a question at this point? Yeah, sure. I have a, you may be addressing this in the future, but what is the relation between the following two things? So your full support, full support theorems. On the other hand, um, my recollection is that in the four known in Mach of de Brievre work, they actually showed that the additional, that you, know, you don't get QUE, but you get something like half of the you know, Louisville measure plus like half of a singular measure. That's my recollection, it may be wrong. So my question is, what is the relation between the full support conjecture and theorems, the theorems, and saying that you have to have a Louisville component a positive constant times the Louisville measure as a component of the limit measures. Yes, yeah, so I think that the, the result of Forman and Marer de Bief, uh, I mean, so the example of the counter example of Forman and Marer de Bief is fully supported and is uh, indeed half uh, Dirac mass plus half the Bengner. And the, so I guess the result of Forman and Marer is, if I remember well, when you have, so you have this decomposition into atomic, absolutely continuous, and um, a third one, which is uh, singular. And if you are, uh, uh, the result is if um, the mass of the atomic component must be smaller than the mass of the uh, absolutely continuous component. But uh, I think that this result, it does not forbid the measure to be fully uh, singular, which will be the case, for instance, for a measure which is supported on an invariant counter set. So, uh, but indeed, it, it must imply in particular, if you have like uh, an atomic component, then you must have an, an absolutely continuous part. And I think that since it is invariant, it implies that this absolutely continuous part needs to be labeled. But if there is no atomic component in your measure, you, you, you could add something which is supported on the counter set, and so something which is fully singular. So, 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 so let me repeat my question. I wasn't quite sure I understood the answer. In the theorems that say you have full support, is there any conclusion that says that it must have a, a Louisville component? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think so, because if you once you know that it has full support, I think that it does not exclude the case of something that would have full support, but would be uh, totally singular. Well, I understand what you mean, but you can rule out a lot of those possible scenarios. Like it can't be like a dense set of periodic orbits, for example. No, no, you cannot have something like that, but I, I don't know. Maybe you could have something like a thick counter set, like something made out of, the, of, of a thick counter set or something like that. Uh, constructing by the, of course, at, at the end, we, we don't know because we, we have not a full characterization of semi classical measures. So we would like to know more. Uh, so I, I don't know if it answers the question. Yeah. I think the question is that it's, that it's not known that it implies that you have a Lebesgue component. No, yeah, yeah. Is this certainly, I mean, actually, it's not known to me that it would imply that you have a, a Lebesgue component because you could imagine having something which is fully singular but full support. And then the result of for and uh, non and matter will not imply that there is a Lebesgue component because in the absence of atomic components, it will not give that. Can I, can I ask one, one more question? Yeah, sure. So uh, I think in, like, in some examples, you uh, to get some interesting, you know, uh, non Lebesgue measure, you needed the period of the cat map to be somehow relatively small, right? Or uh, so, and uh, so things depend a little bit on how uh, n decomposes into a product of primes. At least that was the story in dimension two, right? If I remember correctly. So, so, so if the period was real, if uh, like n raised to some power as identity mod, 
uh, a raised to some power, and and so it depended on this power. If this power was large or small, uh, mm, uh, do do you have something similar in your results or or uh, in higher dimensions? Like, is there some difference uh, between dimension two and higher dimensions? But but yeah. So the thing is, so I think that what you mentioned is that in the counterexample, uh, Porn and Maron and Zdjev, they use the fact that. You know, you have this kind of uh, discretization of the of the torus, and when you discretize a, a dynamical system, of course, you make it like periodic or pre-periodic. Mm -hmm. And so, he, I think that they use this fact to um, to uh, to make uh, they use it to to make the spectral degeneracy to to show that there is a spectral degeneracy and that they can use that, that they can use in order to get uh, a semi-classical measure, which is not, um, uh, which is not the bag. Mm -hmm. But so in our result goes like the other way. So this kind of uh, degeneracy related to the fact that you go at fixed n and that for fixed n you can have some kind of um, like basically you know that uh, nothing bad can, bad can happen up to the Ehren first time. Like you will not see this kind of uh, of drop due to the discretization up to the Ehren first time. When the classical dynamic is relevant, because the classical dynamic is not periodic, but once you pass it, you can see this kind of uh, of uh, going back to the beginning, like faster than what you could have expected. But our result goes the other way because we have like a, a result that goes like in the that gives a restriction on the classical measure. So we have uh, and the restriction that resemble what happens for the back. So we have this is more something like we. We we don't take advantage of spectral degeneracy of this kind of uh, drug due to the uh, discretization of your torus. Uh, on the other hand, we, we want to look at something that really comes from the classical dynamics, the hyperbolicity of the classical dynamics. So no, we don't use this kind of uh, uh, of, of degeneracy. We really rely on the hyperbolic property or kind of hyperbolic light properties of the classical dynamic. Thank you. Okay, so the, the result of, of Schwartz is in the 2D case. And so the, the goal of our project with um, Semyon was to uh, extend it to the higher dimensional. Uh, so the, what we got is uh, the following. So the setting is always the same. You have a, a symplectic matrix and 2D dimensional torus. And uh, you don't assume hyperbolicity, but you assume spectral gap. And uh, you assume that the characteristic polynomial of A is irreducible over the ration. And with these two assumptions, you get the semi-classical measure of A at full support. So first, let me tell a few words about the second assumption. Uh, this is really something you need something that. So this is um, immediate, like this is given for free in the 2D case. Uh, but in higher dimensions, this is really something that you need by, because there are like obvious counterexamples for which the uh, full support property fails uh, that are, were given already by Kelmer, which are so basically the symplectic list. Um, this matrix has a lot of, um, it can be hyperbolic if you choose B wisely, it can have a spectral gap, but uh, there is a, a semi classical measure which is supported only on the like on a fiber, only on position or only on momentum. So, uh, so you cannot have uh, like full support for this matrix, even if it can be hyperbolic and have a spectral gap. So this is really something that you need, uh, or you need something similar. And the spectral gap, this is because, as I mentioned it earlier, we use a one-dimensional results from uh, harmonic analysis. Uh, and so it is useful to have a distinguished uh, dimension. You, you need a dimension uh, on, which, on which to use your fractal uncertainty principle that we will mention later, um, in a few moments. Okay, so this is uh, the real, so the first the thing is the first assumption is more kind of a technical assumption, but the second one is really like a natural assumption. And uh, okay, so let me give you a hint of the proof. And actually, I will start with the hint of the proof of uh, Nirschwarz results, so the, the 2D case. 
So what you do is you take a semi-classical measure and you assume that there is an open set with no maps. And you let uh, phi of nj be as in the definition of the classical measure. So this is, the, uh, this is here. This is this eigenstates for the quantum cat map that converges to the semi-classical measure. Uh, so, you, you know two things, basically. The first is, since the limiting object, since the semi-classical measure has no mass on you, uh, it means that your phi and j, they will be, okay, so here maybe this is a slight abuse to say that they are micro-localized away from you, because the only thing that you know is that this expected measurements tend to zero. And to say that something is micro-localized away from you, you would ask, in general, something which is slightly stronger than, like, a, a stronger rate of decay for this. Okay, but basically we will have like a very naive understanding of that. It means that phi and j has no mass on you. Okay, Look, think of it like a probability measure. There is no mass on, on the open set. But of course, you cannot just use that uh, because uh, yeah, there are invariant measures with no mass on you. Uh, you will use the invariant property. So which means that since you have an eigen eigenstate, if you are if you have no mass in you you also have no mass in any iterate of you uh, for uh, the action of the classical dynamic. And what's interesting here is that, okay, this is clear, uh, that you can make this statement rigorous if you look at a fixed iterate by your classical dynamic. But actually, you can make it something efficient, even for a time, like a, a number of iterates that tends to infinity with uh, the semi-classical parameter n. So actually what you can, so using the tools that um, we relied on, you can make it uh, efficient up to twice the reference time. So which is you take a logarithm of n divided by the logarithm of the uh, leading eigenvalue, so the eigenvalue of minus larger than one, and you take something which is slightly small, you multiply by a number smaller than one. And up to this time, you can, you, you can make the, the fact that uh, PNG has a mass on, the iterate of you, something you, you can work with. Okay, maybe here for the specialists, oh, sorry, why can we go up to twice the reference time except what is usual in semi-classical analysis, which would be the error and first time? Uh, this is because we rely on the fact that uh, the, when you compose uh, an observable by an iterate of A, of course, the derivative will explode in the unstable direction, but in the stable direction, it will, uh, it will be better and better. And so using this fact, we can get something which is slightly better than the usual uh, ego of result. Okay, so you want to use these two things to say that actually there is no mass for TNG anywhere. So what you do, you, you just look at it, you take a small, uh, a small you look at it locally, you took a small square in the torus, so this is like the blue square, it is very small thing. And you want uh, to, you wonder where is the mass. So you start with, uh, uh, with like a vertical strip, a green strip, and you apply a large iterate of your uh, classical dynamic. And so this is the drawing that I showed you at the beginning. You know that this green rectangle will become very flat, like very thin. It will behave like a dense line in the torus. So in particular, if you take a T to be large enough, large enough so that the size of this line is comparable to the size of the torus, you know that uh, this, uh, after a few iterations of your dynamics, the, the green rectangle will intersect, like will fully cross the open set U. Which means that in this, uh, so in the, there is no mass in U, so in the intersection of the, of the green line and the red set, there is no mass for the eigenstate. And since it is invariant, this is true also for the pre-image of this thing by the iterates that you took. So which means that here there is like a small uh, red vertical strip where there is no mass for the uh, So what this means is that if you take um, a, a vertical strip for uh, uh, like in this small uh, square, you can exclude like a, a, a positive fraction of this strip will contain no mass for PNG. Okay. And so, as I mentioned, this is true uh, as soon as uh, you, you can 
have enough iterate to make this line of the of size comparable to the size of the to the diameter of the torus. So this will be true if you remember the value of t that I gave. Uh, you, you can only make it uh, something observable, so something that you can see if delta is larger than a small fraction, a small power of, of, of n. But what this means, uh, so this property of the, when you look at the projection of your, the, of your uh, blue squares, uh, of the, the, the mass of Fnj on the blue squares, when you look at the projection onto the horizontal direction, you get something which is called a porous set, because you have this property that if you look at a, a small part of your set, you can remove something. Uh, there is like a, a positive, uh, part of the mass, an interval which represents a positive fraction of the mass that you can remove. And uh, this property is called porous, and it is uh, reminiscent of the construction of a counter set. So this is a, a counter set. You start with an interval. And what you do is you remove an interval that represents a positive fraction of the, uh, of the, uh, of the length of the interval. And so actually, you can do that uh, only up to a small scale. But since this is a very small scale, it will be. OK, so you know that the, actually the support of, uh, uh, I mean, the mass of FNJ will be on a set that looks like that with a lot of, uh, you remove the lot of vertical flux. Of course, you can do the same in the backward direction using backward dynamics. And you will see that actually the uh, vertical projection has the same property. So you uh, uh, the actual uh, location of the mass will be like in a product of two things with two, two sets with a lot of holes that really resemble fractal sets up to a small scale. And this is where we apply uh, the fractal uncertainty principle, so which is a statement uh, proven by Bourguin and Vyatlov, which is that if you have a function on R, and here, like I put that in red because this is really a one dimensional statement, then this function on its Fourier transform cannot be both concentrated near a, a porous set, so near a, this kind of very particular fractal set. So it implies in particular that a set like, uh, like this, like, like this product of two porous sets, cannot carry the mass of an eigenstate for, um, uh, cannot carry the mass of an element of, uh, of norm one for the, in this space of state. And uh, so why so? This is because uh, in the point of view of microlocal analysis, even if we, we took a square which was a line with stable and unstable direction, maybe uh, it is not uh, like you cannot really see the locally micro locally the difference be, between something which will be like a product of a position time momentum. You can use a, a Fourier integral operator to to put everything being like uh, to to reduce to the fractal uncertainty. Oh, sorry about that. Um, OK, and last remark uh, here, Rho, uh, I told you that the porosity was true. It looks like a fractal set up to scale n to the minus Rho. And here it is uh, crucial that Rho can be chosen larger than one half, uh, just because uh, if you could, you, you can localize up to a scale n minus beta with beta smaller than one half. So if you could take Rho larger than one half, every set would be porous, just because every set would be uh, empty up to uh, the relevant scale. So it is very important here that you go to a, to a scale that is uh, um, more precise than the scale of the fractal, uh, the, of the usual uncertainty principle. OK, uh, so now there are maybe five minutes left to explain how you can carry this proof to the higher dimensional setting. So it will be very uh, schematic. But for the proof, there are very like two things that you need to know. It is the first thing. This is when you take green uh, rectangle like that. You need to know that after uh, enough iteration of your uh, classical cat map, it looks like a line because you want to use a one-dimensional result of uh, harmonic analysis, the fractal uncertainty principle, and that this line is dense. Okay, so. What happens in the higher dimensional context? In the higher dimensional context, what you have is that you still have, since you assume a spectral cap, you still have a direction which, um, so the, 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 the associated eigenspace is a line, 
and uh, is uh, expanded. So you have something that really look like the unstable paths, uh, the unstable space in the two decades. But now you don't have, the, like the other axis is not the stable space anymore. This is the span of all other characteristic spaces. So it will not be contracted by the action of the dynamic. So if you start from any set, it will not look like a line because this could also be expanded. But what you know is that it is expanded at a lower pace than the, uh, the, the leading Hankin space. So if you want that after the, uh, after the relevant number of iterations, this thing look like a line, what you need to do is at the, instead of looking at a fixed fix square, square here, you need to look at a square with epsilon that also depends on m. You need to first do a, a micro localization up to a small scale epsilon. And you need epsilon small enough so that uh, this, uh, this thing will be uh, smaller than one. Okay, so what I tell you is that microlocal analysis allows you to microlocalize up to a scale of the form n to the minus beta with beta which, which is smaller than one. What you see here is that you need, uh, so gamma is just uh, maybe the second, eigen, uh, the modulus of the second eigenvalue, or maybe plus, plus a very small thing. You know that this, uh, after a few iterations, this will be of the same gamma t times epsilon. This must be of size one and is given by the leading of the value to the t times delta. So if you want this to be a size one, you know that you must take a t of the form uh, rho log n over uh, log of lambda plus with uh, rho, which is uh, between one half and one. So if you want this thing to be small, you, you can make the computation. You need beta to be smaller than that. And you see that it is possible, since this thing is smaller than one, to take beta, which is lower than one half, but smaller than this quantity, and rho, which is larger than one. Okay, you really need to start from a scale which is um, larger than the scale of the uncertainty principle and then get information of porosity up to a scale which is smaller than the scale of the uncertainty principle, which is n to the minus one half. You need to go from one, one scale to one large scale to one very small scale. Okay, uh, so this is, uh, an, once you notice that, you get the fact that uh, after iteration, so this is not a rectangle anymore, but a small set, will resemble a line. And what you need to know, know now is that this line will be dense in uh, the higher dimensional torus. And so this is not automatic anymore, uh, like in the 2D case. So actually, you can just see that uh, this line is not any line. This is the direction of this line is the leading eigenspace. And this leading eigenspace, uh, its adherence, so it defines a line in the torus, and the adherence of this line is an invariant subtorus. So it corresponds to an invariant uh, rational um, space for the, the matrix A. And if the characteristic polynomial of A is irreducible of, over the rational, there is no trivial invariant subspace. So you see that it means that this line is dense. And up to some technical points, uh, you, get the, you can get the result with the same proof as in the 2D case. And maybe just one last thing mentions that actually this uh, assumption of the characteristic polynomial, uh, the, the theorem as I stated it is like a consequence, consequence of the main result in the paper because we don't really need uh, you can still say something about the support of semi-classical measure uh, when the characteristic polynomial is not irreducible. And for instance, in the example that I gave you earlier, which has non-fully supported uh, um, in the, in the, which has semi-classical measure which are not fully supported, we are able to, we see that our theorem like acknowledge this fact. The, the, the most general version acknowledges this fact. Okay. Uh, so I think that I will stop here and thank you for your attention and maybe answer a few questions if there are some. Thank you very much, uh, Malo. And we have time for uh, questions now. So please uh, unmute yourself and go ahead if you have a question. Hi. Um, does any of this, have you tried to make any of this work if you um, go away from linear cat maps uh, and said, look at, um, 
what's called the perturbed cat map, which is composing a linear cat map with the time one map of a Hamiltonian flow? Uh, so no, we, we did not try. Uh, actually, so uh, judging from the, the existing literature in the geometric context, I would say that it is uh, it could work uh, because uh, the result of uh, Dyatlov did not know Marer is true in variable curvature. So you there was a previous result by delta and Jean in the constant curvature case, but also uh, it will probably be much more technically involved because of the like the paper of Dyatlov Jean and non Marer uh, is. Um, much more technical than the original. I mean, there are like it, it requires like uh, additional uh, technicalities than in the uh, previous paper by Beatle Pangin. So, um, what I would expect is that it is possible, but up to many technicalities, probably. Of course, uh, one interest would be that uh, something that could be interesting would be to start by a matrix which does not satisfy the spectral gap assumption. And then take uh, take a perturbation to try to to produce this spectral gap uh, to produce like a, to have a leading Lyapunov of exponent maybe for the resulting diffeomorphism. So this would be the interest, I guess, of looking at that kind of perturbed cat map. I think even in two dimensions, it would be interesting, as you say. It's the analog of of. It's not only the analog of, of uh, variable curvature, but you really kill all arithmetic structure by introducing these uh, perturbations. And this is this doesn't sound like an arithmetic result. Yeah, actually, I mean the yeah because the so the irreducibility con condition of the characteristic polynomial we do not use it for arithmetic reason, but just because we need like. Uh, Minimality of the orocyclic flow. This is like the, this is how we use it. So I guess that uh, it, there would be this kind of condition if one wanted to do the perturbed case. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Zev. Uh, anybody else wants to ask something or or comment? Uh, yeah, I do. Kind of related to what uh, Rudik's question was. There's um, completely there. You know, the cat map, the usual cat map you know, it has many representations because you're essentially looking at uh, metaplectic groups and you can realize them in many different ways. So one of the ways you can realize them due to Klusterman in the forties is on theta functions. In fact, uh, you can quantize any symplectic map uh, acting on uh, holomorphic sections of powers of a line bundle. It's a completely general thing, not this very special type of quantization which is available pretty much only if you have metaplectic representation and these sort of these linear cat maps. So in particular, it's available if you take perturb perturbations of cat maps by these Hamiltonian flow. So a natural thing is to try to figure out what exactly does this um, fractal uncertainty principle that you're using imply about the, um, you know, if you convert it into the holomorphic eigenfunctions rather than these, you know, the way that you do it by putting on Z mod NZ, you know, it's, uh, it's funny, I've tried doing this and you run into the problem that converting it from sort of the real representation, you know, that you're using to the holomorphic representation uses the Bargmann transform, which is, a, which is a nasty transform because it involves running a heat kernel backwards in time. So I didn't really come to a conclusion about exactly what it implies, but in fact, it's all asymptotic. So you cannot really apply the usual Bargmann transform, but only some kind of asymptotic version of it. So it's sort of a kind of a question in some sense. Uh, it, it's, it potentially gives you far more general results. Um, how exact, what exactly does the uh, result on <laughs> full support the full support thing, you know, obviously it doesn't matter what representation you use. The limit measures you get are going to be the same in every case. So you can make them limits of just mod squares of the holomorphic eigen sections. And the question is, how do you directly work with the holomorphic setting to be able to prove the fractal uncertainty principle? Okay, so yeah, let just first mention that actually we, here I use the... Uh, 
like the representation using like a z over nz to the d, but this is not the representation that we used in the paper. In the paper, we use like the, the approach of Buzu in the BF, so we really see the, uh, the space of state as a space of the space of Tampere distribution, and we use the- No, no, of course, that's the so-called Zach transform. There's something called the Zach transform or Bresen transform, vague Bresen transform, which goes from these uh, distributions to the theta functions. It's a standard thing in the theory of theta functions. So it's a unitary operator and just maps these distributions, these like periodic distributions or whatever, into the space of theta functions. And you can just conjugate everything into the holomorphic setting, including the, you know, the obviously the fractal uncertainty principle is saying something about um, these holomorphic sections that they cannot be concentrated on uh, these fractal subsets. And it, it seems like an independently interesting question in holomorphic analysis to like understand how do you prove that? So as I said, I tried proving it using these Zach transforms or Bargmann transforms, but um, they're very ill-posed problems. They have very nasty inverses. So I didn't really come to a conclusion about what exactly the fractal uncertainty principle is in the holomorphic setting. Yeah, okay, so I, I don't know either. Yeah, I guess that the idea would be to, of course, yeah, this is like natural to think that like the, um, uh, the fractal uncertainty principle is stated using Fourier transform, but you should be able to state it using like any other micro-localization micro tools because at the end, we don't use it for like position momentum. Use, like you can always use... Uh, uh, FIO to, to, to change a bit the geometry. And so you should be able to state something uh, using, yeah, like uh, something like the Bergman transform or even an FBI transform should also give like uh, an observation of the fractal uncertainty principle, but I'm not aware of any work in this direction. So I, I don't know if someone no, has a positive no, result. Well, that's, what, that's what I've been trying to do. And I'm not aware of anything else either. The FBI transform is the same thing as this Bergman transform and Zach transform. It's just one thing. It's just a canonical way of converting the real representation into the holomorphic representation. Mm -hmm. So in principle, you should be able to just convert the whole fractal uncertainty principle into the holomorphic setting. But the thing is that the operator is highly non-invertible in the usual sense. It's like running a backward heat kernel transform. Yeah, yeah, I, I see you have this. Uh... The relation between vial symbols and turplet symbols are extremely non, extremely ill post problem. So you have to kind of re you have to do it asymptotically, not with the full transform. Yeah, I guess the, the question is, do you want to use the already given fractal uncertainty principle as it is proven by Bogan? Right. Do you want no. to have a, like a new proof in the realm of well, both of them? Beautiful. That's a beautiful question. I, unfortunately, not even the best holomorphic analysts that I've talked to have any idea. What is the, what's the statement for holomorphic functions, like finding polynomials, if you like, holomorphic polynomials concentrated on uh, for these kinds of fractal sets in the plane. Yeah, I guess the only thing is that since there is a result, there should be like, a, I mean, I guess that when people would expect the, like the assumption of the fractal uncertainty principle to be something which is actually not related to the Fourier transform, but actually a microlocal statement. So the, there should be something, but of course, it's not of use to phrase it, I guess. Precise. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone else want to say something? Or the same person, as Steve, if you have more to say. Uh, can I ask one more question? Yes. So, uh, it's a, so suppose you have uh, sort of high, uh, suppose the period model is small of this matrix and you have large multiplicity, right? Then you can have like one half Lebesgue plus one half delta. Now, uh, like in an old paper with Steve, we, we had this result uh, on a sphere where we also have large multiplicity that linear combinations of periodic orbits were dense in the set of all measures. So you could approximate sort of any flow invariant measure by these linear combinations. And then you could get more complicated flow invariant measures uh, coming up as quantum limits or semi-classical limits, right? So uh, can you try do something similar in the, you know, small period case where you have multiplicity. So you have deltas and then, you know, try one half Lebesgue plus one half, you know, something more complicated than a delta. 
uh, I'm not sure how feasible is that. If you can you can you transition from like one delta guy to a couple of them, but so so if you can, maybe you could have like some more exotic uh, invariant measures coming up as you know part of the semi-classical measure. One half Lubeck is also is always going to be there, but you know something more uh, complicated than than a single dot. Yeah, yeah. I guess that if you, yeah, because I guess that the op would be to say if you can to use okay the fact that the delta measure are dense in the invariant measure. So yeah, you should be able, because yeah, it seems. I mean, uh, it's it's not like a sphere, of course, but it's maybe it's in some sense it's similar, but. But, but maybe maybe this will not work. Simone, you want to say something? Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a co-author on this. So um, I just wanted to mention one thing, that there are examples of exotic measures which are not fully supported for quantum cat maps uh, due to Anantaraman and Nonanmasher around the same time as, Anant as, as, as for, for uh, Nonanmasher and Dubiever. But those examples are for the so-called Walsh quantization of the cat map. And so you could have something supported on a fractal set and uh, miss the full support property, but the choice of quantization is different. And our proof wouldn't work because the fractal uncertainty principle fails. So somehow the entropy bounds and usual proofs of quantum ergodicity don't, don't rely on the specific choice of how you quantized your map. But tools that use fractal uncertainty principle, they do use the specific choice of quantization, which is why those examples don't appear for us. I don't know if it's helpful, but you um, should know that these things are out there too. Okay. So I don't quite understand the statement. You do use a specific quantization, but the end result does not depend on it, does it? It does, it does. If you take the Walsh quantization instead, then Anand Tarman and Nonanmash are constructed examples of measures that would, for 2D cat map, they could concentrate on a fractal set of any dimension, at least one out of two. So at least half the full dimension. Now, so I, don't, I, don't, I don't really understand how this is possible. The limit measures you're, you're getting do not depend on the quantization. But it does. I don't understand that statement. I know that the holomorphic one has to agree with the um, quantization that you're that you're well, using. Well, the Walsh quantization gives you a different operator because the Walsh Fourier transform corresponds to multiplying digit-wise rather than multiplying. Uh, you well, know. that may be some peculiar form of quantization, which doesn't have the properties that a quantization it does, really ought it to does. have. It does. It satisfies all the standard properties. It satisfies. Uh, are we course. talking so about the cat map uh, or the Baker map, Semyon? Uh, uh, oh, wait. Am I being wrong? This is the Baker map. Oh, that was quantum for what quantum map. Baker map. I'm sorry. Yeah. But it's still it's okay. a quantum map. You're right. You're right. I'm, I'm very sorry. This was for Walsh quantized Baker's Baker. map. Baker. But it still satisfies that quantization does satisfy all the kind of properties we typically use in proofs. And that's right. the, the fractal uncertainty cat, principle is the, in, right, it's, it's a Baker's map. That's right, that's right, I'm sorry. But anyway, so somehow it doesn't, but say if you try to do it for the non-Walsh quantized uh, Baker's map, you would probably have different limits. So somehow the, the, the tool that we use here, most of the tools don't depend on the choice of quantization, but the fractal uncertainty principle does actually depend on how you quantized the system. It, 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 it cannot be derived from standard properties of quantization, it has to be proved in a different way. So there remain mystery, but this is all very interesting. Steve, you want to add something? Yes, maybe one remark that uh, with Dima's question before. Um, the thing on the sphere that he was mentioning, I, I proved that it works in general as long as multiplicities of the eigenspaces tend to infinity and the trace of a pseudo differential operator or an observable in that eigenspace has a, has a vial asymptotic. And if those two things are true, then I don't be I believe, like even on a flat two torus, when you have only logarithmic multiplicities, you, uh, can get, you can get all these different possible types of limit measures to occur. Actually, probably what I proved is that the random one was luvial, but I think you can, you can um, 
you can do what uh, Dima was saying. It's really more a matter of trying to figure out how to get the uh, atomic measures to appear. Thank you. Perhaps it's time for another question or another comment, if there is. We have time. You don't have to stay if you don't want, so we have time. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, yeah, well, uh, I was wondering, so, sorry, I don't know any of this. Um, is, uh, do we know for a fact that the uncertainty principle is, tr is false in higher dimension? And does it have, uh, does that have consequences on your results? Okay, so the, yes, I mean, the, the thing is in higher dimension, it is not obvious what should be the statement of the fact that uncertainty principle, because if you start with something very, uh, uh, very like the naive thing does not work just because if you if you take like a, you are on r2 and you take a direct mass on the x-axis okay uh, so this is supported on the x-axis which is a, a fractal set so, i mean it is it is very porous in one direction uh, it has a dimension half of the ambient dimension and if you take the free transform on this you get something uh, which is uh, supported on the y-axis. You get a direct mass on the y-axis, which is for the same reason, something which has very small dimensions that maybe deserve to be called fractal. Uh, okay, but this thing like carbon zero. So you, you get, you get, okay, so this is not a function, but uh, modify it and you get something which will be um, uh, supported near a, fractal set, like a, a line, something which has half the ambient dimension, uh, whose Fourier transform has the same property. So this is like the basic obstruction to the higher, ver higher dimensional version of the fractal uncertainty principle. So the way that we have to bypass this um, restriction is just that when we apply it, we project everything to the, we project everything to the leading eigenspace, basically. Uh, which is, of course, uh, when you want to get porosity, this is when it is like the, I think the projection, which is porous, is, of course, the, like the hardest thing to prove because you you cannot get rid of some, something. So that's why there is this need of uh, like micro localizing to a small scale. And this is okay. the reason for the need of a distinguished direction in, uh, for the dynamic. Okay, so it's indeed linked with the fact of having one special direction, which is going to be your one di your one dimension in the end, and uh, yeah, so yeah. without the spectral gap and, and the spectral gap hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, this is like the same the same line. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps it is a good time to thank uh, Malo again for this talk. Thank you very much, and uh, we will. Return next week with a talk by Ilaria Lucardesi, who will speak about maximization of the first Neumann eigenvalue of the Laplacian under perimeter constraint. Uh, until then, have a great week and see you all next week.